Welcome to Thriving Rockstar with Alex Rakin. Today's guest is Sarah Joanne Draper. How are you, Sarah? I'm doing well, thank you. Awesome, awesome. So I uh, had met Sarah this past uh, NAMM show. We had uh, run into one another, and uh, I've been following her work for a while. If you guys um, are on Instagram, uh, check her out at Sarah, uh, rather, was it Sloppy Joe 67 right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Who, What's the origin of that? What's why sixty seven? Um, why sixty seven? I just like that number. It's really kind of random. I had a T shirt that had sixty seven on it when I was a little kid, and it was my favorite shirt. And that's just been my favorite number ever since. Sorry, the story isn't as um, exciting as you well, think. That's no, okay because it's like you're obviously not born in nineteen sixty seven. So <laughs> 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 unless you're a vampire, in which case I, I wouldn't doubt that either. <laughs> <laughs> No, I um, I love yeah. garlic and I love the sun. Okay. <laughs> Not a vampire. <laughs> Not yet. Um, so, um, you know, one thing that um caught my eye um and why you know I wanted to have this conversation, I noticed that you uh well, you're in shape, right? And so you take care of yourself. Um, and also you're very multifaceted as far as like your um the kind of content you put out there you're you're singing you're playing guitar uh you're genting <laughs> and yeah. and you're and you're a painter as well yeah what, what came first art came first um since i was a kid like you know a little kid um i remember i first started to really love art in like first and second grade i really liked like anime and stuff like that and i would just like draw anime characters and then it started moving into like still lifes and I took every art class that I could and um I was into gymnastics and stuff too mm. so I loved performing also and I kind of got out of that like gymnastics and stuff and moved on to taking piano lessons and guitar lessons and stuff when I was like eight so that's mm. how that kind of progressed. Right. But, but it definitely came first. But the itch to perform kept going and that sort of like uh, is continuing through music, right? Yes, yeah. Um, the, the first time I seen you uh, was, um, it was NAM last year, uh, the winter NAM of 2019. Um, and you were at the Tosin booth and you just kind of happened to sit down and just jam out a little bit. <laughs> That moment was very intense. So I was there with me and a bunch of my friends were just like walking around and um, we just ended up stumbling upon the Abbasi booth. And I was like, I think it was the first day too, the yeah. first time that, that year. And I was just standing watching and then Tosin looks at me, looks at me and he's like, hey, Sarah, you want to riff? And in my brain, I was going like, no, 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 I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I said yes because you're not you say yes when he asks you to rip yes so, um yeah that was really intense but i loved it i mean i loved the guitar and how it sound how it sounded um and he obviously like didn't think it was too bad because he posted a video on my on his instagram of me playing <laughs> yeah. so that was like a moment for me i was like holy shit like that was cool but yeah, that was probably yeah. one of the most intense moments I've ever had at NAMM. And you were watching that? Yeah, you, I was there. I was like right oh, there shit. watching it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was dying. It was really funny too. I mean, um, I'm not saying this is like a bad thing or whatever, mm -hmm. but they didn't have a chair. They just had an amp head yep. on its side. Oh, and I'm really yep. short. I'm 4'11", and my feet couldn't touch the ground. So they were just like <laughs> dangling. And I was sitting there with this heavy ass guitar with no guitar strap and Tosin's looking at me and literally filming me. And I'm just like, <laughs> it was cool. Though. It was really cool. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. That must be an intense experience. Did you, did you know Tosin prior? Like, did you guys meet prior to that? Yeah, I've met him before. Um, we're not like, I wouldn't say that we're friends. We've just met briefly a couple times. Like I've never really hung out with him or anything. But I play his pickups, and I've demoed at the Fishman booth a few times, or a couple times, and so he, like, knows of me. Like, that's why he was like, hey, come riff, and I was like, ah! Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, I had yeah. It's it's funny because I had approached I had approached that booth a to check out his guitars because they're awesome, and also to follow up with him because you know we've spoke about him coming on here, and so um, he's a busy guy, <laughs> that's yeah. for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. My first encounter with Tosin in person was um, back in uh, I went to the John Petrucci Guitar Universe thing, the second one. Oh, sweet. Yeah. And so that, that awesome. mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to go this year. Um, but um, I got to hang out with him, you know, learn a little bit about him as far as uh, my interests are concerned, which are, you know, beyond music into the fitness and stuff. And he told me he does CrossFit and um, spoke about that, about that, worked out with him in the gym there. Um, but uh yeah, well, let's discuss you a little bit more, um, or a lot more. You know, we have some time here. So, uh, how um, did your gymnastics early on sort of influence how you've sort of what What did you do after that to keep yourself physically active? Oh, okay. Um, so I started gymnastics when I was like four or five, like before I could even remember wow. really anything. Um, and I did that until I was like eight and then I started doing competition cheerleading mm. not like school cheerleading but like competition cheerleading and then um that was where I found because you kind of perform in gymnastics but you really perform in competition cheerleading because you're just like doing backflips and stuff in front of audiences but um I think that's when I really realized like hey this is really awesome like I love doing this and you can't do cheer forever you're kind of like if you do cheerleading in high school after that, it's just kind of like, okay, you're done. Like that was cool, but it's not really like a lifetime kind mm-hmm. of, but anyway, so I stopped doing that when I was in eighth grade and that's when I started playing guitar and stuff like that. Um, mm. and yeah, I just, I, that's why I stopped doing cheerleading is because I just found that I love that way more. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, and then since then, uh, well, here's the thing: the cheerleading. I could see how that kind of stemmed out of. Um, oh, okay, okay, yeah, I get yeah. Your sense. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So, I learned a lot about like stretching, and it really. Um, I love to run. Like I run. I do a lot of cardio. Not even. I mean, yeah, because it's like fitness, but also because it just feels good, and I like to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it taught me a lot about stretching and a lot about. Um, not my boundaries, but my limits okay. and how to like push your limits and stuff like that. I haven't really had a fitness coach ever since then. I have trainers sometimes, but I just move a lot. So it doesn't always last very long, but, mm. um, yeah. So it just taught me a lot about like pushing my limits and a lot about stretching and how important it is. Right. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, what's, you know, and I see sort of a natural progression there from uh, gymnastics, which really got you in touch with your body before you can even remember. Um, and that's that's something that a lot of musicians struggle with. They're just not in tune with their bodies. Um, and that actually manifests itself through the hands and through their musicianship uh, or lack thereof, you know? Um, so that's something that I've sort of uh, noticed in... Um, I only got into fitness and things like that after say 20 years old. Right. So that's when I really started to kind of, uh, change my body. I was like a fat teen and, you know, so I, I I was a gamer and I, I got into the whole fitness thing and I realized how being in tune with my body completely changed my relationship with, um, well with my body and how that translated to being more dynamic at my instrument and just being a little bit more open and expressed in general. Um, and I've I've noticed that, and I've sort of helped uh, move my students in that direction because I've been teaching all the all the while, and and that's kind of like what ended up at this whole thing. So, um, so it's it's definitely something I love exploring, and so I could see how you went from uh, the gymnastics to the cheerleading, and then you know into the cardio and just kind of constantly doing something like your body needs to be used, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, and, and, uh, it needs to feel like it's there essentially. Right. So what, what do you do nowadays? Like, how do you, uh, what's your routine for that? Now, like the extent of my exercise is just like, I, 
go to the gym. I haven't been very good lately, to be honest with you, like the past month or so. But when I'm um, doing really well, I have a plan that I go in three days a week and I work on arms on Monday. I work on legs on Wednesday and like chest and back on Friday. And then I do core all three days, Mm -hmm. different core exercises all three days. And, um, I go to planet fitness and they have these, um, I don't know if you have ever been there, but they have like a massage room yeah, yeah, yeah. where you go in and they have like water sheds, Yeah. They like shoot water into your back. And, um, so I go into the gym and I sit on one of those beds for 10 minutes and I talked to one of the trainers there and he said that's really good to do that. Not only because it's just really relaxing. I just love doing it, but it really loosens up your muscles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then I'll do 10 to, I very rarely do 10. I usually do like 15 to 30 minutes of cardio, depending on how I'm feeling that day. Um, Just like either the treadmill or something like that. And Mm -hmm. then I'll go into the stretching area and stretch. I'll do different stretches for a minute at a time. And after that, I just do my arm workouts or back or leg workouts. And then I'll do core after that. Interesting. So when you're, um, when in regards to stretching, let's say, right. Um, do you have any special attention paid to, you know, the, I guess the muscles and joints that are used more during like, let's say playing guitar. Um, and do you have any stretches around that? Like say like, you know, the whole, uh, stretching the uh, forearm and things like that. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I never really thought about that. I don't really do any specific guitar stretches while I'm at the gym, mm-hmm. but I definitely do stretches and stuff like at home before sure. I practice. Like this one right here. Mm. And do that. Mm-hmm. And each of my fingers. And uh, my friend Sims taught me this one. This one kind of hurts if you do it too much, but like you hold your hand out like this. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. Can the people in the podcast like see me? Well, um, so, yeah, people who are like watching the uh, video okay. portion, so, but yeah, you, you, mm-hmm. but like you hold your arm straight out like this and point your thumb up and then fold it inward and wrap your fingers around that and mm-hmm. just press your fist down. Oh, interesting. And that stretches all mm. this here. Yeah. For those of you who are listening to the audio, she basically just put her arm out straight, um, tucked in her thumb, and then basically just um, sort of pointed her uh, hand, the pinky side down. So stretching the, uh, the, I guess, the thumb side of the um, the arm into the into the forearm. Hard thing to really interpret from that. Yeah. But yeah you'd watch the video for that. <laughs> But yeah, okay, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, it's important to get the tendons and um, and the forearms stretched. I heard a lot of different techniques for that. Um, I remember uh, Joe Satriani told me one time that uh, he he dips his uh, arms into water, um, into warm water backstage, like not his fingertips because he doesn't want to get the callus all like broken up. But he'll put his entire like uh, maybe from the elbow to the wrist. Yeah, I was about to say, like, I was thinking that exactly when you said that, I was like, wouldn't his fingers get all, like, soft? Anyway, Mm -hmm. but uh, that's really crazy. I've never heard about that. Sometimes um, when I practice and my arms hurt afterwards, Mm -hmm. I'll stick it in warm water and then switch to cold water and back and forth for, like, 10 minutes. But I've never thought about doing that before. That's actually a pretty good idea because I hate playing when my hands are cold. Like, oh, my God. Yeah, and you probably don't hold um, heat that well, <laughs> I'm no. assuming. <laughs> no, I have a heater right here at all times. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear that. And and I easily um, change in temperature, let's say, right? And and I have, like, often uh, I have active sweat glands, right, around my hands. So, um, in other words, if my hands get a little moist and it's a little cold in the room, they get freezing. Oh, wow. That must be so annoying. It's extremely annoying. And, and you know, frozen hands feel like when you're trying to play metal, right? <laughs> you can, but it just hurts. Yeah, yeah. You could like push through, but it's it, it feels so stiff, you know? Yeah, so when, when I'm in the situation where my hands are just in, in that state, I, I try to keep them as dry as possible because, you know, 
Um, everyone's hands are different, but um, I definitely slow down if my hands are not in the right temperature. Uh, I'd rather my hands be swampy and hot uh, and sweaty and just like just <laughs> leaking all over my neck than to be cold. You yeah. Know? Yeah, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I'm cold right now. It sucks. <laughs> Um, so, but yeah, mm -hmm. so as far as stretching and stuff is concerned, um, people think like, oh, you know, I don't think too much about that. It, you know, if we're trying to play the long game and this is uh, my conversations are often about how do we extend our careers and, and keep putting out content and, and keep the ability to perform as a, you know, just being active as a musician for as long as possible. Right. And, and what can mitigate an injury and what, what are these little things that we can sort of pick up along the way. And so um, that's why I love, you know, having these conversations. That's what I nerd out about. <laughs> so um, you, what's your primary, um, like, like you, you have a few things that you're doing. What would you say that your, your general goals are as far as like where you're trying to take things? Um. So right now, my main focus is, um, like today, all I spent my time on was getting my song ready to record the pre-pros for. Um, right now, I'm working on mainly getting my next EP out. I don't know if it's going to be an EP or an album yet, because I have a lot of songs ready. It's just um, having the money to record everything. and <laughs> But, you know, so... Yeah, that's my main focus right now is saving up to record and get everything finished and get a bunch of videos made for my next EP and to tour on that. And on the side, I'm doing like YouTube videos and doing a lot of art and keeping in shape. Like that's a really good one too. Yeah. But yeah, definitely my main focus is my band Anchor Thought right now. Mm -hmm. And... um. Uh, so you you haven't toured in a while, right? Uh, well, you 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I can see how that all that you're doing is very useful, and especially in the age of the internet today, that like you really have to be tending to your audience. You can't be doing anything in silence anymore. You have to constantly keep up um, a conversation with uh, with your fans and building new relationships with them. You know, we're responsible for that nowadays. There's no like label sort of taking care of that. Um, I think it's as much a blessing as it is a curse, right? It's 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 a curse in that we have to be the ones to do all this weird things like, you know, creating videos and all these peripheral um, things instead of being there writing music and, you know, doing what we're put here to do. We have to take on all these other roles. Uh, but on the flip side, we get to build that relationship. Um, and from a business perspective, we'll have that audience to um, present our product to, right? And uh, and they're very bought into what we do. And all we have to do is just keep tending to them, build that audience, and then um, whatever we create, we have a platform to land on, right? So, yeah, uh, go ahead. I was just going to agree with you. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and so that that's the, that's a very big thing that you're up to there. Even just like people might think, oh, you know, you haven't put out anything in some time, or you know, any concrete album or something like that. But people um, underestimate, you know, that building a following part because if if you did the opposite and you just kind of like really just did nothing but write, you would have an album and no no one to hear it, essentially. So yeah, it, it's good what you're doing. Um, now, how did you, uh, where did you start from as far as like your guitar playing and how did you get to where you are today uh, stylistically? Like how, how did you make those choices? So I started playing music when I was eight. I learned piano mm -hmm. and then I kind of focused on like cheerleading and gymnastics until I was 13 and then I started playing guitar and that's when I started doing music like every day or like as often as I, as I could. I was just playing like regular, I really liked the 90s era of music, like grunge and stuff like that. So I played more simple stuff for a really long time. Then when I was 14, I learned how to play bass and 
when I was 15, I started taking drum lessons. I'm not really a drummer. It wasn't really my thing, mm. but I can do some things. But I just stuck to like regular kind of rock, hard rock stuff until I was like 19. And then I got really into the kind of stuff that I play now. I was listening to like Pliny and Scale the Summit and Animals as Leaders. And those were my main ones. And then it's kind of weird how it worked out because I never really listened to metal growing up that much. Mm -hmm. And I found that kind of stuff through listening to like Animals as Leaders and Pliny and Scale the Summit. And I was like, oh, this stuff is really cool. So I kind of skipped listening to like Pantera or Megadeth, uh -huh. Black Sabbath or anything. Right, right. Prior to that, it was just like, what What was it prior to that? My favorite band is Smashing Pumpkins. And ah. um, I really like Sonic Youth. I mean, I still like them. I just don't really listen to them much anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, like Pearl Jam and stuff like that. And I really liked Jimi Hendrix. Um, I'm trying to think of other things. But like you get what I'm saying. I um, get it. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That kind of stuff. I still like it a lot, but I just don't really listen to it because I've already listened to it so much. I'm just like, okay, I need more notes. But, <laughs> but yeah, so I was like out of high school. I wasn't going to school. So I had a lot of time to just practice a lot. And I think like from 19 to 20 was probably the biggest um, leap that I had as far as like just being, just getting better. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it was all, it all just started with finding a bunch of new instrumental bands. And then I found the heavier stuff and I'm still not super into death metal, but I'd get into it sometimes depending on the band. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it progressed. And I just got, I already had a laptop, but I got like logic pro and I started recording and stuff mm. like that. And I wasn't even going to do anything with it, but it just, I enjoyed it so much. I kept doing it and I started to find people that were willing to work with me. And I recorded the first Anger Thought EP last, no, it was the year before last and released it last year. And now I'm working on the second one, which is really awesome. And I had no idea that it could like bring me like a new community of people to just be around you know what I mean? When I started doing it, but that's what's happened. And I started going to Nam, and, you know, it's just like meeting a whole new world of people outside of where I grew up. It's really cool. You know, I think we should kind of, um, spend some time emphasizing the meeting people part. There's a lot of bedroom guitar players and musicians in general who are, um, obsessed with getting better and, but they don't really communicate. They don't, they don't meet other people. You know, it's really a who, you know, business. And, oh God, yeah. uh, and so you, your tick, you know, definitely took a great leap and going to Nam, you know, um, where do you, where are you based out of normally? I live in Baltimore. Well, live I live in, like, I live in Towson. It's like a little, you know, suburb of Baltimore, but yeah. In other, in other words, nowhere near LA. <laughs> oh <God>. <laughs> right. Like I'm a New Yorker. And so, um, having that, you know, realizing the importance of, that you know you'd be you'd spend the money to fly out and the time to fly out to to nam and 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 network over there you you obviously seen the uh you know the benefit of that right so how do you how do you approach that and if you have, have any kind of thing you know or, or would you consider yourself more introverted extroverted um so what do you mean how do i approach it like how did i approach it in the beginning or how do i just approach it well how, how did you arrive at the the, the realizations like you know what I, I should probably meet people in this field <laughs> did that just, was that just self-evident yeah it just happened naturally i suppose i was working with this guy i grew up in roanoke virginia mm -hmm. which is like five hours south of here mm -hmm. and i was in this guy's studio and we were just like noodling around and he worked with Diodario at the time. And he was just like, Hey, would you want to go to Nam? And I'm like, what's Nam? Right. <laughs> it was one of those things where, um, I was just blown away. Like I looked it up, like what it was after that happened. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to not go to this. And I had never even been on a plane. I was like, 
19 and I was like, holy shit, like I'd never really been outside of Virginia that much at that point in my life. And I just went over there and I met a bunch of people and nothing really happened the first time I went. Like I hung out with people and I met a bunch of people, but you know, I didn't like get any endorsements, nothing crazy happened, but like that's really what you need to do is just building relationships with as many people as you can and just not being a dick. You know what I mean? Right. So that takes you very far. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was just natural to me basically. Like and I've traveled a lot since then, you know, and mm -hmm. that's the main part, especially if you're like me and you're someone who's from like a smaller place that no one really knows about. That's nothing's really happening there. Like you have to go like, you have to go somewhere else, like where there's more people who are forward thinking and um, who just want to do stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because if you're easy to work with and you're not a dick, if even if you're just okay or not okay, but like you being really, what I'm saying is like being really good and sitting in your bedroom, like you were saying earlier, isn't, what's going to get you like off the ground and get you on the map. You know what I mean? Right. 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 There's right. so much examples of people who are just like, um, they have like a, you know, they're resentful of others. You know, they, they might have more technique, um, but, but then someone else has more success, but you know, they sit there in their bedroom and they, they don't do anything about that. They don't release anything. They're not creating content. Um, and, you so they they have you know they, they can't be mad because like that they're not putting in the work that's necessary today so that's and that's a great point that you made if you live in a small city you got to get out and the other great point you made there is like don't be a dick you know like that's that's so important right the, we need to emphasize how in a people business right um word gets out if you talk behind people's backs things like that it it just word gets around you know, you're just, you're known as that person. And this community in particular is very small. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, everyone's, it's, it's small compared to like, you know, other entertainment industries, but right. right. Yeah. No, it's definitely a small, uh, you know, small community and it's important to, you know, be careful, you know, it, it, to watch your words, you know, at a place like Nam, it's such a intensive networking uh, experience for those who uh, have never been um, or who are, who are curious it, it, you know you very well might end up having like pancakes at IHOP with your favorite rock star you know so this this you know true story <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah so um, and you you really have to well for one um, I think it's an important thing like like you in the in the case of you know um, where where I seen you first at the uh, Bossy booth, right? Mm -hmm. You were a total fan of um, Tosin's playing, and and it was one of the three bands that kind of took you into the style, right? And so that, I'm sure that was like a very like that was definitely one of those moments. That yeah. may have been like the most intense moment I've had at Nam, right? Aside from like actually doing demos. Well, no, when you do demos, you like you're you're aware that it's about to happen, right? So like I think that was probably definitely one of the craziest things. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you um yeah, you you got to be prepared for that <laughs> yeah. to 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 happen and uh, and then, you know, ride that wave. Um so yeah, it, it's such a cool thing. Um so I I feel like networking is definitely uh you know, an important facet of things and if you can't get out of your city uh, so often, uh, at least you could build an audience online and you can put out content, uh, and just do your best with that. Um, and people you can definitely mm -hmm. like get pretty far doing that too. Yeah. Uh, you know, Gary V. I don't believe so. Okay. So Gary V, uh, is this, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. He's huge on, on Instagram. He has like a few million, uh, followers. He's like one of the biggest social media guys. Um, and he talks about just putting out content, just put out content, put out content, you know, don't be, um, don't not put out content cause you think you're not good enough yet. 
right? It's better to put out content even before you think you're great uh, because you'll never really think you're great. <laughs> but uh, putting out yeah. putting out content to the best of your, your ability as often as you can. Uh, and then so in time, you know, you'll, you'll rack up one person at a time if you're putting out things consistently, people know to expect more and more. And also those people who followed you in the early days, they're going to be like, oh, I knew him when he was like, you know. So I think that's very, very strong. And those are the people who become the true fans. If you, you ever heard of the, the Thousand True Fans? No. Uh, so try, th there was this uh, essay, Thousand True Fans, where like you, um, who was it by? You could find it online, read it for free. Uh, it's a great great essay it's like 30 pages or something like that where it talks about you know how to build an audience and how to build an audience to become fully sustainable as an artist or as anything else you basically um you focus on getting these true fans people like if you um i think the hypothetical that was built up in the um essay was that if you get a hundred people i'm uh, sorry if you get a thousand people to spend a hundred dollars a year on you, right? But with, you know, purchasing content, subscriptions, whatever it is, right? It's a reasonable amount. That would be a super fan, right? So you only need a thousand of those people to make a hundred grand a year. Um, and that's, I guess, a respectable, sustainable amount that you can, you know, at least launch off of. If, if not, you know, be comfortable, especially if you're on your own. Um, so that whole concept of, you know, building that in and, and a few other things are discussed there to, help make that happen but yeah uh, it's you know i could talk all day on this whole networking thing and just the, the value of that but um let's move on um so you do a lot of different things how do you manage your time so i don't know if you can see it back here uh-huh it's very faint but i have a big calendar back here uh-huh um i basically just have little sticky notes all over it there's no calendar that i could buy that was big enough because i needed like big on my wall mm. so i just made one with tape but i kind of don't manage it very like it's very sporadic but i do the best that i can like on sundays i like to paint that's how i keep that um on lock and then um i just try to find a really good balance and make sure that I'm not doing too much of one thing a week. You know what I mean? Because mm. like, it just depends on what opportunities arise and like when they happen. Um, like right now I've been working on my album a lot more and I really haven't been painting and drawing as much as I want to. Mm. So yesterday I just like bought a bunch of canvas board and I'm going to start working on that because I just love doing it. It's really like decompressing for me. Um, I have a certain time that I go to the gym. If I miss it, miss the window in the morning, I'm not going to do it because um, I don't, I just, I'm a morning gym person. Got it. So I reserve the mornings for that. And then during the day, I usually play guitar and work on that kind of stuff. But as long as I'm getting everything done that I need to, there's like goals that I have that I set. There's usually a pretty good balance of everything. So it's really just about goal setting. And I think after doing this for so long and just being a multi-instrumentalist and an artist mm -hmm. my whole life, I'm just naturally, that's just naturally how my brain works is it kind of balances itself out. Interesting. Um, so, the one characteristics that characteristic that most musicians lack or musicians, artists in general is conscientiousness. You know, the ability to like be very meticulous with your time and like very organized with everything. Right. And that, um, the artists that do develop conscientiousness are the ones that succeed because they have the creativity and they have the responsibility, put that together. And that that's a very winning uh, <laughs> combination, right? But sometimes it's like controlled chaos, like in your case, right? It's like you have, you know what you need to get done. There are certain things that are slotted in and other things where it's just like kind of loose, but you know, you, you, you get enough in, right? And if you're not, then you sort of prioritize that a little bit more, right? Yeah, like I literally have a coach that I call once mm. or twice a week and like he helped me build this board that I have right here 
Uh-huh. This is what his job is, is right. to talk to mostly creative people. Cause like what you just said, that's totally true mm-hmm. about like people, most creative people just not just lacking that in general. Mm-hmm. And I totally, um, I don't know. I don't totally lack it, but I definitely need an outside perspective to like look at my life and be like, you should make a board or you should, um, try and balance things out more or why haven't you gotten this done yet? You should focus more on doing this and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, that's something I should mention also. It's really awesome to have an outside perspective of like a professional to help with that kind of stuff. I love that. I love that. You know, because being artists, you know, maybe we don't have to really kind of become like these paragons of like responsibility and you like you you can outsource it to uh someone who it is their job and and you stay accountable to somebody, which is really, really cool. So it's like a life coach, huh? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Like I I mean I've I've sort of like had years in self development, you know, for myself and so that's what I anchor myself on. But even then I have the knowledge and it's even worse having it and not acting on it, right? And I still need to be accountable to somebody. Uh it, it's very powerful. And if I'm not accountable to a particular person, then I sort of like post something, say on um a story or mention it in a live stream or something like that where I get just fans and just the people involved in what I do, um, knowing what I'm going to do or what I plan to do. So then if I don't do it, I let them down. Right. So it's just that kind of social pressure. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That, that I haven't, that, that's the first time that came up in the show, having a coach that you outsource that to, And, uh, it's, it's definitely a useful approach for sure. Um, in that same regard, I was going to talk about mindset and, um, I'm sure they talk a lot of mindset to you as well. Mm-hmm. And the reason behind, you know, having the calendar and all of that and the goals and, and, and all those things. What, what was your biggest takeaway? What was the biggest, the most impactful thing that, that your coach had you do? Um, hmm. I feel like a lot of what I've learned from it is how to, well, it's not even... I think the biggest thing that is helping me so far aside from like having someone who's holding you accountable is um, it's kind of forcing me to not take things as they come to me and to sometimes like basically just prioritize my time. Mm. And not that I wasn't doing that before, but for instance, like if someone's like, Hey, let's go get a drink or something like that. Um, when you don't have your goals in line and you're not prioritizing your time, you would do that and you wouldn't even think anything of it. And not to say that doing that is bad, but it's narrowing my focus Mm -hmm. is probably the biggest thing that um, has helped me because that's my biggest problem. I think is at least like as an artist mm-hmm. is I just put too much stuff on my plate. Oh yeah. 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 I'm uh, listen that I have the same issue, you know, I have ideas for this and that and, you know, and, and it just extends even beyond music. You know, I have app ideas, this and that. And I realize that nothing will get done if I'm doing everything. Right. So only a few key things make it through this little, um, uh, bottleneck that I have to put it through um, so as to not work on more than let's say two or three projects at the same time um, with particular goals of where I want them to go and uh, and I whenever I have a new idea or a thing I want to take on I have um, a note system that I just kind of plug it into uh, like back burner you know and then just not do that until I say complete a project and then I could take on something um, and, and prioritize, of course, you know, what the next most important thing to take on that'll take me ahead the most. Right. Um, but yeah, no, that's huge. That's huge. It's, it's important to, you know, and prioritize, you know, what you're doing. Um, and I know whenever I, my goals are not set, then, yeah, like, like you said, if someone wants to go out, whatever, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, let's, let's go. 
Um, but if I know particularly, oh, wait, I didn't get this, this, and this done, or I, I, I still didn't get this done for the day, I'm going to feel guilty, right? Um, and that'll drive me to kind of stay and, uh, and, and make that happen. Yeah. Um, people would think that they can direct themselves and just get stuff done and they don't need to do these things. Uh, and they don't realize that they're just going to naturally drift into um, non-productive behavior. Yeah, and then and, a year goes by and you're like, oh. Yeah, it's crazy. I've seen it. I've seen it happen with me, you know, uh, in some regard, you know. So it's 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 good to stay focused. And like you said, uh, like outsourcing it. Um, so how uh, your parents were probably pretty supportive of all this artistic stuff as you were growing up, right? Um, yeah, like they put me in art classes. I was really lucky to have um, a really awesome artist. Her name is Anne Bernard. She lived right up the street from me and I would ride my bike to her house and she did, she had like a little studio outside of her house and she held lessons there and I would go there um, once a week for years and that helped a lot. She taught me how to paint basically. Mm. Um, and I would always go to music classes and stuff like that. Like I was in jazz band too. I was, um, I played bass in jazz band mm. and halfway through high school, um, I was in public school until 10th grade. And then in 11th grade, I went to a private school that was like based on like kind of focused more on art and music. Like half the day mm. you have your regular school stuff and the second half of the day it would be like whatever art you were doing. So that was a really big thing too. That's cool. I mean, like, you know, you, uh, obviously your parents paid for that. <laughs> so, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unless you were like scholarshiped to the, to the max. Um, but yeah, that, that, so it's important that, um, because, because I, I didn't have the benefit of a parents, like basically supporting completely. Right. Like it'd be like, um, they would support, but they would also be like, Oh, you should probably get a career. That's not music. Well, they definitely wanted me to do that too, but yeah. like it was pretty obvious to me and I was really like stern on like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Sorry. Right. But, you know, it might, I'm not saying that I won't have a different type of career at some point, like sure. other things happen, but that wasn't in my realm of sight at that point. Like mm -hmm. yeah, they were mm -hmm. really, um, saw, they saw that music helped me a lot, I think. And, and art too. So like they helped me as much as they could, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. It's best they can, right? It's an important thing. Um, well, I mean, your relationship to parents and stuff, it's, that, that's a critical, uh, it's a critical thing. Um, speaking of relationships, um, you know, I don't want to get too like down into the intimate if you don't want to, but like, um, have you had any uh, relationships with other musicians, anything like that? Oh, you mean like, like, like like intimate relationship, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my boyfriend, he's in a band called Grey Lotus. Okay. Um, they they toured last year and they have an EP out too, and they're really awesome. But we don't like mix. You know, I'm not like in a band with him. Um, right, right. I personally have only had bad experiences with that. Um, not with him, but like with in the past uh -huh. mixing that kind of stuff um some people do it and it's totally great um but yeah i don't like date within a band but i've definitely pretty much only dated musicians not because i like have a thing for musicians but those are just the people that i hang out with and makes sense me and my boyfriend were friends for a while before we like started dating and stuff like that so it's just the people that I'm around, but, um, but that's yeah. interesting. Like, okay. So you, you're around them and you can relate to them. Right. Um, but when it comes to creating together, it, what happens that, um, that's a no, no. Is it the, the kind of clashing of heads or like how, how, uh, how does that I not work out? Now that I'm older, it probably wouldn't be an issue if I, if that was something I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you're a teenager, drama is, you know, like, oh, yeah, whatever. But um, 
it's just never, I mean, like we've jammed and like we teach each other things. He's better than me. He teaches me more than I teach him, but, um, it's, it's never really. And we also like play completely different kind of stuff. Like Mm. we just wouldn't mesh if we were to do a project together, but we like have jammed and stuff like that. And that's fun. I'm not against doing that, but as far as like being in a business relationship with someone that you're in a relationship with, mm. it's like, it's tricky that, that it can be, you got to tread carefully in those circumstances as, you know, just making a business with any loved one that's that, that can tarnish the uh, relationship with the person, right? When business gets tough, right? So there needs to be boundaries. There needs to be a very particular thing set. I mean, it's the same thing as like even, not quite the same thing, but similar to like going into business with a friend, you know, just like you have an idea. It's like, oh, okay, let's, and and when there's a disagreement, when things get tough, um, your friendship could be on the line. So um, so it's, it's very important that it, if, something is entered into like that that there is a very clear idea of you know the extent um that it's 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 a you know the business relationship separating it from the personal yeah and i'm not saying that i would never do that but Mm -hmm. it's just it just an opportunity like that hasn't really set itself up for me and i haven't really sought out to do anything like that but um yeah so right now i'm just like we don't need to do that. Like, right. We have our own thing. Like, that's how we met. You know what I mean? Sure. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, because I, because my bass player and his girlfriend have been making music together, and so it's interesting. Um, but there isn't a pressure, um, associated with, say, you know, trying to make money off of it or anything. It's just for fun, right? So it's it's hardly a business. It's more of like a it could you know, even a positive thing. You know, they get to have fun and you know, cover some tunes together, even create ones. Um, but yeah, I can, I can see, um, especially if there's two very creative people who have, uh, their own creative direction to instill. Um, and they can, if they're also partners or, or they have a close friendship or something like that, there could be butting of heads and, and that, that could, uh, that could be tricky. Right. So, um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's definitely something that, you know, if, if it's something that you are up to, um, for the listener, um, it's, you, you, you want to be careful with that. That can definitely be, uh, it could be the end of, of your relationship in some ways, or it could be something that you can grow through. So who knows? Who knows? Yeah. I know plenty of people who do it and it's great. So yeah. Does your, uh, since your, your partner is also a guitar player. Um, um, do you encourage each other to practice? Yeah, definitely. Like you ever see him and be like, oh damn, I gotta go practice. Yeah, <laughs> my house. He was here earlier and he was like practicing while he was here, and I was just like chilling. You know what I mean? Like um, mm-hmm. we definitely do that, and we definitely um, look at like watch each other and like see how we can help each other improve and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and we both understand that we both have to practice, and sometimes we're not going to be looking at our messages for a few hours. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it well, works. I've never really like, I've never not dated a musician, sure. so I don't really know. I wouldn't really, I couldn't really imagine myself not dating a musician because, like, that's what I do. Right. It's like the only thing I do. So, like, it's like a fish trying to see the water. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get it. I get it. And so, I mean, I've had non-musician relationships and even my current one. Um, and so, yeah, there's definitely a more of a like, oh, like, oh, why didn't you answer the message? Like you said, like, like you kind of understand, like you're, you go deep for, you know, X amount of time or whatever. And then you emerge <laughs> um, and other things that, you know, m- musician specific idiosyncrasies that, you know, a non-musician partner would have to put up with. Um, and understand and come to terms with, and also us understanding non-musicians um, in, in those cases. Um, it's very common that an artist states an artist, and I think it's because of the temperament. Uh, it's hard to understand someone who doesn't, at least on some level, think in that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I've had many conversations on the show regarding you know, different relationship styles. And 
Um, does he tour sometimes? Yeah, um, they toured for, I can't remember if it was in April or May last year. But yeah. But we were also long distance at that time. Mm. So it wasn't really like a strain because we already like weren't really seeing each other that much. But um, Interesting. So yeah. You, mm -hmm. did you guys meet long distance? Yeah. Yeah. Like I lived, well, I mean, it was like we lived two and a half hours away from each other. Okay. And so it wasn't like super long distance. And then I moved to the place where I grew up for a couple of months or a few months last year and we were like five hours apart and I moved to Baltimore where he lives um, a few months ago, like in November. No, it was in December. Wow. It hasn't been that long. Yeah. Recent. I moved four times last year. It was a lot. <laughs> wow. But yeah, no, that, that's awesome. You, you closed the gap, you know, I'm, I'm also in, in a long distance uh, relationship and, um, it just happens to be that this person is literally on the other side of the planet. So oh, is she like in Japan or something? Thailand. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, but yeah, we make it work. We make it work. Yeah. I, I even started a blog, which is currently paused, but uh, called 8,000 Mile Love. Right. So um, may as well make a blog out of it and give some value to people who are going through this similar uh, experience. Uh, but understanding, I, I mean, I think it's it's a helpful thing that if you can, if you're in a long distance relationship, I think you're actually more primed to be successful at dealing with a musician or being a musician who tours and dealing with someone who doesn't because you're used to the distance. Mm -hmm. You're used to trusting each other from a distance. Um, and I think that's that's a benefit to, you know, what I have going that it's just an understanding of like, well, I'm away for this amount of time because of circumstances and that we could make it work and, and do the things that we need to do. You know what? Let's, let's break that down. So when you guys, before you guys close the gap, how did you uh, stay in touch? What, what did that look like? A lot of driving. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So like every couple weeks or like once a month, depending on like, how our schedules were like one of us would drive um to either place we would like take turns or something like that mm -hmm. but yeah it was just a lot of driving basically but i mean that's the once a month but uh, in the interim you guys like stayed on video or what'd you do oh yeah like skyped mm -hmm. or like facebook messenger video or whatever yeah, and like yeah. Talk a lot. but yeah um yeah but we like we just came because like we we don't have like regular jobs where you have to go in every day, so it's just like um, we could pretty much just if we felt like it, just drive for five hours and stay for a couple days or something like that. Wow. Um, but yeah, that wasn't really like I don't have trust issues, so that's not really a thing for me. Um, I don't really rely too much on a significant other emotionally so i that's not really an issue for me either long distance i just like it's really awesome being close to each other and not having to drive five hours right so just being 10 minutes away and being like oh cool like i'll just come over for a minute or something you know what i mean yeah um, but um i was gonna say that i kind of miss it but i actually don't at all right <laughs> because like the one thing that is cool about long distance is that like it's so um exciting when you get to see them not that i'm not excited now when i get to see them but like you know what i mean it really like builds up oh yeah i would also just rather be able to see them all the time you know <laughs> th there's a long-standing tradition uh across many different cultures of um you know, one partner basically going out and, you know, going on the odyssey, right? And then coming back home to his family or wh whatever the case may be. And it's, and I think it does build that intimacy because there's the longing, right? You don't get to miss somebody if they're there every minute. Um, so even if you are 
in close proximity, if you're focused on whatever it is you're put here to do and you really put your time into that, then when that person gets you, even if that's at, at the end of a week, um, it's that much more rewarding, you know, instead of like taking them for granted, being there all the time, you know, especially if you work with them and you're, you know, you're with them 24 seven, you can uh, even grow resentful. Um, so it's important to get to miss somebody, it seems uh, on some level. And so one of the conversations, like I said, I have on here is like people going on tour and maintaining the relationships back home with, uh, with their loved ones. And what I find oftentimes is that the more independent their partner at home is, um, the more happier, you know, the both, uh, of yes. the, them are. Um, and I've mentioned this a few times, but in, in different episodes, but in, in, uh, my second episode I did with Casey Grillo, you know who that is? That's a drummer of, uh, uh, old drummer of Camelot. Mm-hmm. Um, but essentially he, um, he told me his wife painted the house when he was gone, like on his last tour, right? Just productive, you know, just taking care of things and, uh, and holding down the fort essentially. Um, but of course there's always the keeping up with, you know, I'm sure if when he's on tour, he's like calling you on a regular yeah um no you don't have time to do that but that also like goes hand in hand with like dating another musician is that like I don't think about it like that like I know what the deal is like I'm not gonna be sad because he's doing what he wants to do you know what I mean yeah yeah but you tend to be an anomaly though like you're you're very secure yeah I mean it goes back to what you said a second ago about like um, the more independent you are, then like the happier the relationship will be. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that goes just for like when the other person is away somewhere. It's just like in general all the time. Like, I mean, it's if you're in a relationship with someone, like they're going to make you happy when you're with them. But like if you're dependent on them for that, then it's just never going to be good. No. Like, when you're apart it's just like it's just not you need to be secure like in yourself before like a relationship is gonna work you know what i mean yeah i think uh, i I read a book by david data um and it was just talking about you know codependence and interdependence and and different styles of relationship and the ones that are the healthiest are the ones where both partners are independent they fill up their own cup and then they can love from the extra that flows over onto the other person rather than needing the other person to fill their void and vice versa. Like you guys are both full cup and, uh, you know, just only giving value and, and, and that kind of relationship, one plus one equals three, you guys, you know, create something stronger in between you guys. Um, and, 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 and really, you know, that, that, that's, that's a beautiful thing, you know, when, when you can have that kind of independence, and and people aren't always, you know, people can't always be at the top of their game. And you you, you know you understand sometimes some someone's in a weaker state, you know, and uh, and you're there for them for th- through that. Uh, but in general, it's good to, you know, strive for that kind of independence. That's great. Yeah, definitely. I was about to say like sometimes you know, it goes back and forth, but um, like the underlying, like deal needs to be that. You know, like you said, one, two plus one plus one equals three. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was gonna say like, how did he word that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I get what you mean. Hmm. Um, you briefly alluded to this earlier, but as far as your career, um, you know, what do you see in the future besides your next EP and all that? If you're thinking ahead beyond that, uh, has your coach kind kind of sat through that with you, just like something like long term? Yeah, I think that's, I didn't mention this earlier, but I think that's one of the big things that it helps me with also is um, looking forward in the future rather than, because the way that I have done it in the past, I just have a whiteboard and I write what I'm going to do for the day, which is helpful, but you need to have like a week, a month, six months, five years. And I'm still working, honestly, like if I'm being honest with you, I'm still working on the five year thing. Mm Mm-hmm. I've gotten better at doing a weekly calendar and like monthly or like past that. But, um, 
we really haven't solidified a five year thing yet, which is actually, it's cool that you say that. Cause that's what my next step is really. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to be a little more sustainable, like with money and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I'll probably, I really have no idea like where I'll be because like five years ago I had no idea that I would be where I am now, but also, um, I definitely am going to keep doing music and I want to be touring and I want to maybe even fill in for other people, whether it be like bass or guitar or vocals, um, for tours too. Um, I think that would be a lot of fun. And I'd really want to, I don't know. I think being sustainable is like the main thing. So you're pretty clear on what you want your music career to progress into. Um, How about your art? What what, what do you think that would, uh, what would be the most ideal circumstance over the next few years with that? So with my art, I've definitely made the decision to have art as my second deal. Um, I love music and the community of music way more than I like the art community. Mm. And what I would like to have, I've been moving around so much that it's just like, it's been impossible the past couple of years, but, um, I really want to have like a space, like a studio where I can hold classes Mm. and, um, just hold events even, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like I think teaching kids would be really awesome mm-hmm. and having a place for other adults to come and paint. It wouldn't be that wouldn't be so much of teaching as it would just be like having a space for people to like come together, but I think that would be really awesome. So too, just having a space mm-hmm. to make all that happen. Nice. Yeah, so that that's definitely a direction. Now, one one thing that really kind of changed the trajectory of things for me personally, um cuz you you have art and you have music, I have music and I have fitness. Um, and I came to a point, I think it was Tony Robbins I was listening to, kind of like encouraged me to combine the different things to create something unique. Here we are, Thriving Rockstar, right? Um, and this kind of stuff. And, and there's other derivatives of that connection um, between two separate paths. Um, and and there is, you know, I find I found there's a community of people who fuse those two things. So I'm sure um, you'll find ways to even, if you want to, fuse music and art in a sense, like make the artwork for your music or create animation, whatever it is, right? Um, in a way to kind of synergize both passions there, right? And just kind of create something that's whole you, you know? Awesome. So... Um, there's plenty more we can discuss here, but yeah, I'm going to let you go on your merry way. And um, it's been great having you on. Um, where can people find you online? So I am on Facebook and Instagram. And I have just made a Twitter, actually. Mm. I have, I started using it like last week or something. So I have like 20 followers. Hit me up on there. Um, <laughs> awesome. But Instagram and Twitter. I am sloppy Joe sixty seven, S L O P P Y J O sixty seven, and Facebook is just Sarah Joanne, um, and my Anchor Thought page. Anchor Thought is the name of my band. Mm-hmm. We're on Instagram and Facebook as well. So it's spelled um, like Anchor and then Thought. So yeah. Awesome, awesome. So see you soon, Joanne. Uh, Sarah, rather. <laughs> I'm using your middle name. <laughs> See you soon and, uh, you know, hope to catch up with you. Yeah, thank you for having me.